Now we ended the last section talking about how the French are going to have a revolution and how Napoleon Bonaparte will eventually take power and how he's going to come in and conquer other countries. He will actually come in and take over parts of what become Germany. And he will actually, and this image is showing his arrival in Berlin, which he managed to conquer. Right? Berlin was the capital of Prussia, which is the country that would go on to unify Germany. Right? But that's Napoleon right there on his white horse, riding a triumph into Berlin. And remember, this experience is going to encourage Germans to say, we need to unify. We need to form one country. And that's where a very important historian comes in, who essentially, when you think of 19th century history, think of this guy, Leopold von Ranke. Von Ranke was a professor at the University of Berlin, which was founded in order to help Germans unify uh, and kick out the French. <laughs> so, I mean, the University of Berlin was founded in response to the experience of being conquered by France. Right? So you have to keep that in mind. History is closely connected to politics. Even when it's saying it's going to follow scientific methods, that doesn't mean there's no connection to power. Now, von Ranke is fascinating because, and you can see, I think, the scientific ideas here, that the purpose of history was to show what actually happened. Very, very easy definition of history, to show what actually happened. And you can see this kind of scientific idea here, right? We're going to find the laws that govern things. We're going to show you how chemicals actually interact. We're going to show you how a plant actually transforms sunlight into energy or something like that. Where history, the purpose of it is to show what actually happened, to discover the truth about the past. So you had this kind of objectivity. That's the idea. But what's fascinating, though, is Ranke, who was a very devout Christian, uh, Protestant, believed that every era was immediate to God. Now, what, do you, what does he mean by that? He's adopting Farnherder's idea of historicism, that we cannot judge other periods of history by our own standards. We need to judge them by their standards. Now, this is very important. This is very much connected to nationalistic understandings of history. Right? Because there's this idea that we are a national community. No one can judge us but ourselves. Because other people don't understand us. So it's this interesting idea, right? Because he's a Christian, he believes in God, but he kind of rejects an understanding of a, of a universal history. Or at least of a history where we can stand outside of history and criticize other time periods, right? The problem with saying that we can stand out his, outside of history and criticize other time periods according to our own standards is our standards are shaped by our own historical context. But the key thing here is if you're wanting to build a nationalist history focused on the nation state, it makes sense not to emphasize human universals, but to emphasize how each group of people are different. So we Germans are immediate to God, just like the French people are. We're not saying France isn't important, but they have their own history. We have ours. And we're the ones who decide what our history means. But again, don't think that this means he wasn't scientific in terms of his methodology. He understood and emphasized and developed ways to engage in the careful, critical examination of documents. Just because this guy was nationalistic and wanted to help contribute to the building of a unified Germany doesn't mean he was a, a bad historian who ignored the documents. He did. He wasn't. He wanted to discover a kind of scientific methodology of history to understand what actually happened through the careful, critical examination of documents. And he argued that historians should gather facts and write so that the unity and progress of events would be apparent. So we carefully read the documents, we analyze them, and then we communicate them in a way so that it makes sense what is happening, so that people can follow along. So we pick out the important facts, and we put them together in a kind of unified package, a unified narrative that shows how things happen.
right? You can kind of see there that understanding of history as the um, study of change over time and why that change happened. A lot of that originates with von Ranke. Ranke is also very important for his emphasis on the archives, right? Archives or institutions, they could also just be someone's room basically, where historical documents are housed. And Ranke, similar to Edward Gibbon, right, is interested in going out and looking at historical documents. And he's especially interested in finding new ones that people have not been using. For example, private papers. Um, for example, and this is paralleled with the opening of many historical archives. For example, during this time period, the Vatican, right, the popes would open some, not all, but some of their archives. And they even allowed von Ranke, a Protestant, to come in and look at Catholic history. And he was very excited about all this, right? But he's going to emphasize doing strong archival work, going out there, looking at the documents, carefully examining them. And he's able to do this because in the 19th century, there's a growing emphasis on opening government documents to help write national histories. So places in Germany, France, other places in Europe are going to allow government documents and other documents to be read in order to help people write national histories to give people, the people, a sense of their own national identity. You can see how history helps to shape national identity. Von Ranke is also very important for footnoting. When he cites a source, he gives you a footnote so you yourself can go look up that source to see if he's being honest, to see if he's using the source correctly. And also, of course, you may want to use it in your own research. But right, notice in science, you're supposed to be able to replicate results. If a scientist publishes a uh, experiment and says, this is what happened when I ran my experiment, other scientists should be able to do get those exact same results. If they can't, there's something wrong. That's basically what footnoting is. Right. I, Von Ranke, as a historian, have gone through and looked at these documents. This is what I found. I think this is correct. Here's where I found the documents. You can look for yourself. See if I'm correct. Trying to put history on a footing with other sciences, you can see. One thing I think is very striking, um, you, you know, you look at these images of Von Ranke, and maybe you think of this kind of stuffy historian. I just want to highlight a quote he said. I won't say too much about it, but he talked about looking for virgin archives where he would have a sweet and magnificent fling with the object of my love, which in a sense is a wonderful romantic way to talk about history. But by this, he meant looking for archives that had not been yet explored. And he just wondered what kind of historical truths can I find in them? Now, von Ranke also is very important in terms, not only of research, but also in terms of teaching, right? Teaching and research he would focus on politics in his research. He paid careful attention to the historical context, right? But also he was shaped by his historical context. Remember, his university was developed in order to help encourage German national unification. And he was shaped by that. So naturally he focused on politics, right? Naturally he focused on politics. And this led him to neglect other areas. If you're interested in how people become politically unified, you're not going to be so much interested necessarily in, say, the history of women or the history of workers. So that's kind of a blind spot in von Ranke's approach. It focused on politics because political concerns were first and foremost among many people, especially the idea of German unification. But one thing very important about him is his development of what's called the seminar method, right? The seminar method. Um, you will take classes at Lander that will be referred to as seminars. You may say, well, what makes something a seminar? A seminar is not a lecture. When you have a seminar class, and this is something von Ranke pioneered, you're supposed to read stuff, and then you come talk about it. So von Ranke would give his students assignments, say you're going to read these primary sources, you're going to go read these proclamations by this Prussian king. And we're going to talk about him next week. And you would go out and read that. And then you would come and von Ranke wouldn't get up there and lecture a bunch and tell you what to think. You would discuss the sources. And that's how you become a historian in a sense. And that's why, Joe, people think that the more advanced courses are harder to teach. No, 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 no. The more advanced courses are easier to teach because the students have to do more. Um, when you teach like a graduate level class in history, basically you just make, you just find a bunch of books and you're like, okay, we're going to read one of these every week. And then you get together and discuss them once a week. 
that's typically how a seminar runs. And then you write a paper. There's usually no exams. But he pioneers this approach. And seminar classes are wonderful. I love taking them when I was a, a, a graduate student because it was fun. You got together with a small group of people who read these uh, primary and secondary sources and you discuss them. But he pioneers that method. And what happens is students of his would help found graduate programs in other places, including the United States, right? Including the United States. So Americans will go study under von Ranke and learn from him and bring this method to the United States. So von Ranke focused on politics and he tried to come up with this other, this, his own scientific understanding of history, but he's not the only German doing this, right? There's another German, Karl Marx, who's also trying to do that. And that's pictured him um, on the left with his two daughters, and that's his buddy Frederick Ingalls on the right. So I need to talk about Marx because he's also, in a sense, one of these scientific historians. Marx is most famous as the founder of communism, and he tried to find the scientific laws governing history. And he is going to argue that history is driven primarily by class conflict. Right Now, you have a video on him. Um, I don't want to go too much into detail. I've talked about him in class before. But I want to stress, notice how he's understanding history a little bit differently. Whereas von Ranke focused on political history, in a sense, the actions of kings and prime ministers and things like that and armies, Marx is going to say, no, that's not really the driving horse, force in history. It's economic class conflict. That's the driving force in history. So there's a different kind of perspective in that way. And like I said, I have other materials. You're going to read some Marx, so I don't want to say too much about Marx. But um, as critical as I often have of Marx, I'm, I'm pretty anti-communist. Uh, I'm not a big fan of Marx, Marx's history, in part because Marx's history says the study of religion is unimportant. But remember, that's what I focus on. So I, I guess I have my bias. But I think this is a very interesting thing that Marx wrote. Men make their own history, but they do not make it as they please. They do not make it under self-selected circumstances, but under circumstances existing already, given and transmitted from the past. So I think he does a wonderful job explaining how we do have free will and we do have options. We do have choices we can make, but those choices are um, limited by the historical context in which we live. But again, von Ranke and Marx, both people trying to put history on the level of science.